Okay, on Friday last week, I did this Perlin beam here, and I decided because it's taking most of its uh, the structural purpose of this is to do with stopping the house from falling apart sideways and that's where the, the tension is going to be pulling outwards and so I've gone for this long vertical um, connection joint um, but now today I've decided well I mean the thing is I thought there was going to be um, a wind brace but there might, maybe there won't be a wind brace and in the absence of that what I've decided to do here is put a five centimeter tap um, tenon here and make a mortise in this wood at that point well actually I might put it at the top no, it has to be in the middle uh, so I'll mortise that into a tenon put the tenon into a mortise and the same thing on the other side um, again more easily seen and watched done than uh, described in words you'll get the idea once I get started. So my first order of the day is to mark up accurately five centimetres to the edge on both sides. So I haven't really got out all of my tools yet because I had to go and sort out some business to do with one of the with my uh, car that's um, broken down. I've got a, a, vin a veteran car vintage car that's broke. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop filming for a second and go and uh, sort out my tools and uh, pick it up from there. And the same on the other side. So I've marked up what I want to get rid of.
Uh, this has got a great big chip out of it. Dropped it. So this will have to be done. I won't bother doing that on the work site to get rid of that, that chip. It's too much metal to have to be taken away. So I'll do that in the workshop on the grind wheel. left. Slightly more difficult doing that uh, horizontal cut, so I haven't gone so close to the line doing that. Actually, what you can see looks very close, but on this side it's not as close to the line. But cutting this direction with the chisel or with an axe is very, very easy because it's with the grain. So there's no point in uh, there's no point in being too uh, bold because uh, it's so easy to adjust it like this. Now is it worth getting out the electric uh, multi-tool, the vein saw? No. got the chisel handy and to be honest it's quite cold and uh, <laughs> I quite fancy the banging to warm me up a bit if I've been too hot I don't want to get too hot in this weather that's really bad getting sweaty in cold weather is really not a good idea in Norway so <coughs> My decision making process about which tools I'm using at what moment can have a lot to do with that. There's no right way of doing these things, it's just the way you do it. I don't know, there's a, there'll be a bit of a flow in your work. Oh my god, I'm babbling like. Well, I had too much coffee today, I think. Or my, it's getting camera warm or something. Would you, perhaps you'd like to hear a bit of music. I did a song with my daughter. Maybe I should put that on. This is being filmed, isn't it? So, it probably would have been quicker to get the electric multi-tool. But it wouldn't have warmed me up, would it? This is definitely warming me up. Right, the next one's more difficult because it's... I don't want to turn it around. Right, that's just now where they're going to be... This is going to be difficult probably because doing these horizontal cuts with the chainsaw is more difficult than the vertical ones.
black marks on here are the five centimeters. Let's have a look, is that in shot? Yeah. Uh, you might have seen these, the black marks, they're five, it's a five centimeter. Um, it's telling me that I can use the saw at different angles. That's why it's slightly curved because obviously you have to you tip the saw at different angles so it's about it's five centimeters worth it's pretty much right it's 5.1 in fact but i mean that was just drawn on freehand but i mean it's a helper thing i use it i use it that kind of marker to see what i'm doing those things they i kind of use them i don't think about it now that i'm actually started to, to try and tell you a bit, a bit about my working process just now that I'm thinking about it, but normally I don't think about these things. They're just there. And that might be a bit... I don't want these to be too tight, really. I want them to be just right, actually. <laughs> I'll get back eight if I carry on like that. These trousers I'm wearing have got pads in the knees and uh, they have sewn pockets, which is, uh, I've tried the ones that you kind of strap on to your, to your legs as well. They're really not as good because they restrict the flow of your blood. Have them stay up, you have to have them quite tight. And this type just doesn't do that much better. So, uh, any of you that wonder whether it's worth the uh, quite major expense of buying these kind of trousers, I don't know, you could probably make them as well. I have thought about making them myself. But what I'd really like is to have is some leather working clothes. In the museum in Oslo, there's this fantastic uh, exhibition of um, working clothes from the 1800s, fishermen's clothes and stuff. They're all made of leather. Brilliant. So, I often look in charity shops for leather trousers to see if, because one day I'm sure I'm going to make a pair of working leather trousers out of, for working in. And I will definitely make sewn pockets for knee pads. That and the fact that I'm so used to having using the two meter ruler, the folding ruler. We don't use those in Britain and the, the little building experience I had when I was a youth in Britain it was all tape measures. But since learning to do these uh, Norwegian buildings, these old traditional log houses it's just a really good tool for that it's used for so many different things uh, because there's a lot of stuff to do with transferring or line scribing and transferring planes from one piece of timber to another on the same plane and uh, that's where your tape measure is useless but these flat blocks with several parts that can be unfolded one at a time you can have you know you can it's like a, a that's a distance you know it's a fixed distance so we use that a lot so two builders will have two of these and it will be it'll be two of those or three or four or whatever so it's easy it's very good very fixed you know, way of measuring without having to use numbers. The danger of using overuse of mathematics in uh, building is that a lot of the a lot of us are dyslexic, including me. And uh, it's very easy for the numbers to get muddled around and if they do you, you know you're in trouble. So uh, there's nothing like using geometry and uh, these kind of practical 
that's the practical application of your understanding. Because, you know, being dyslexic doesn't mean that you don't have any, as much understanding. It's not really a kind of intelligence disability. It's more the way your brain structures information. Actually, dyslexics are better at building, I think, on the whole. Certainly, there are massive disproportion of artists who are dyslexic. And it's to do with spatial awareness. The dyslexics have a, a different, differently tuned spatial awareness. So this stuff is easier for us. Yeah, that looks quite good. It's quite up to the old Japanese standards. But there you go. This is a barn. Not a palace. Mind your toes. That is kind of This is kind of why the edges are chamfered. Staying there. Not with that one, that's for sure. Doesn't have a long enough reach. There we go. Safety first. So it feels a bit tight, but I don't want to split it. I mean, there's a kind of fine balance here between. Getting the right thing, splitting your work. Oh, that's quite good. Well, my axe isn't heavy enough for doing this. It would have been a nice big club for doing this. That joint has tightened up. That one's a bit loose. What I want is equal distances on each of those. But before I do this very, very fine adjustment, it's very, very important that this is the right height and the right angle. So that needs to, this end needs to come up slightly. And when you look down it, you can see it's too far in. It's come out a centimetre or two. I might even put up what I called a thread in the previous video, which is actually what I mean is a piece of string, a line. If I put a piece of, if I put a line from that far corner to uh, to here, then I can really, really know whether or not I've got my piece of timber straight. And I'm going to do that this time because I want this to be good. And tumble stock one blade. Same at the other end, one blade. Okay. So now we can really see the difference. It's That's good. Well, that's all a blade thickness now. Make sure that the uh, level is the same. Right, so that has to come up slightly, but less less than I think. I'm going to put something under that, but it needs to be, I think, actually less than this bit. I've got a safety saw just there, but it's not plugged in. Is that enough? Right, that's level now, which means now I can mark the precise, which again is another use for this. Uh, it's less 
less than two blades, more than one. It's about 4.5 millimeters. There we go, I've got a gap on the other side. Uh, they should be the same. So they should be all more than more than one and less than two. So I can cut it from the top edge there. If I just angle my pencil slightly up. It gives me slightly more than one. I need the same distance there as well. So, so that all needs to come off, all those black marks, and then it should just go pop together. Oh, all the ones look very straight. I'm going to run out of tape now, so... Okay, now I've showed you the quick and dirty way of doing it. I'm going to show you the masterly way of doing it, using calipers. You set the caliper to the largest distance of all the different joints I've got here. I find the one that's the biggest. That's that size. And then I mark the described line. Making sure that the tip is touching the face. Not, not that edge there, but the very tip. So it's tip to tip. And see the difference between that and my pencil marking is about half a millimetre. And then using a very sharp pencil, I can fill in. Yeah, it's pretty much sharp enough. And then I can just drop that down into the groove that was made with the line scribe. just to give it a bit of colour. It's a bit messy that top one. And then the same thing on the other side, you can't see on the film. Right, then I'll cut that. Well, that's good enough now. The observant of you will have noticed that I am actually building a second story now. Top Sweden, as it's called in Norwegian. The top Perlin, is it Perlin? I'm a bit unsure of these English names. So, the way I do that is I make sure that the top one and the bottom one are perfectly aligned with each other. go in very very slightly half a millimeter a millimeter so you get the idea I can make the adjustment and before that's on the inside I think the outside is perhaps uh, well actually these are the very similar these so they should be the same on the inside and the outside oh bubbling they're not quite the same on the inside and the outside like to have them the same on the outside really. So uh, any adjustment that I'd like to make I can make I can still make in something like this lap joint here. So if I want if that's slightly wider than the one at the bottom which it actually is about a millimeter but uh, actually a millimeter is enough I don't mind letting a millimeter go. Uh, I'm already being a bit pedantic with this building over over careful and I think that's partly because I'm filming it. So anyway, the point of this little bit snippet now was to say 
that uh, I'm building the top half of the house down here on the ground so that there's less work to do up on the um, scaffolding building as soon as I've got this uh, this exact length correct from that part that I did the other day I think that's in one of those films the second or third film maybe the third film is about that that's that piece of uh, tapered wood which I now realize I didn't actually film at the time which was split with a chainsaw hewing with a chainsaw uh, so I that, that gives me this this part here was exactly the measurement that I want to use both at that end and at that end which I found difficult to describe in words the other day so that's what I'm going to do now is put, make that beam that goes across there that gives me the exact width of the house and then when I've done that I'll make the actually I'll start to make the roof construction because everything else is ready to go all of the standing posts are uh, cut all of the wind braces which are diagonally in uh, placed in the wall are cut so I just need to make the roof construction and then uh, I'll get a bit of help next week with uh, some scaffolding and we'll lift everything up in place and then build a roof on top of it this is 7.75 uh, this thing here which is uh, half of the uh, the width of the material. So, uh, it's something I learnt from uh, Jon Borgegudal, who is a bit of a guru in Norway when it comes to timber, things to do with old building techniques. Um, it's a kind of key. This one is a simple one because it just has this part, but um, this, this is the, the size of the timber. Uh, this might be the depth of some of my taps, five centimetres. Um, I can put more features on this as I need them. So this one is just a, a key for doing that. It's the same both ways. And I can put that on there and that would give me my width of my timber. You make a new one for depending on the, the gauge of the timber because each sawmill makes a different uh, the different thickness of timber. It's not deadly accurate but it's, uh, it's good enough. I mean you can measure each piece you're going to put. When, once you know where the pieces of wood are going to go you can measure them but this, this is how, uh, if you find one of these in an old barn somewhere some, sometimes they're kind of shaped, uh, they might have a, a cut there as well, have different cuts on the edges. That's what they are, it's a key for building the building because they used to just throw them away when they finished with them because each new building had a different delivery from a different sawmill. Top tip. This piece of material is going to be the one that's the most uh, weather prone because it's going to be used on the outside of the building, the bit where the carport's going to be. Now I've checked down the length of it and it's now sitting with the bow upwards and there's just something that I wanted to uh, mark here that I don't know if you can really see it on the film but uh, there's a slight crack here. Now all the pieces of timber have that slight crack and that what that means is that if it's going to split somewhere it'll split along these sides and that's desirable for that the splits are on the sides and not on the top. But if it get, because if it, gets a, if it gets a split on the top that can fill up with water and uh, make it rot. So uh, that's just a little top tip. So again this is my most even and tightest grain piece of t material. Let's have a look. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven or eight ear rings for a, for a centimetre and more at other points. But I mean, it's quite good that it's even. It's even. Uh, that's quite an important thing. I keep on breaking into Norwegian. Sorry about that. All right.
there's another practical reason for building the second second story or the the top speed, the uh, the purlins down at this knee height because instead of bringing lots of benches and workbenches and, or making workbenches I just use the building as a platform for working on and if I want to work at this height I can work there if I want to work a bit lower just find a place that's a bit lower it's not the perfect situation but it's kind of the practical reality and uh, Good way of minimising all the amount of effort that you have to use to uh, to set up and get going. So this is one of my good quality pieces, and that's because it's going to stick outside the building, and we'll uh, have weather on it. it. Needs to be high quality.